something very diplomatic. Yeah, Perfect. I say that. <laughs> oh, look, and there's another one, Mark. <laughs> So, you know, as Jean said, I've sort of been the grasshopper of jobs, but one of, what, what has become one of my very favorite places is the Galapagos Islands. And um, so kind of just, this was from 2015. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this volcanic eruption on Wolf Volcano. It was, it was complete, pretty unexpected when it happened. But my first time in the Galapagos was actually um, in the 1980s. And when I went there in the 1980s, Imagine field work, you know, everybody here, most of you have all done field work, and all day diving in cold water, cold sulfur smelling showers. Big, okay, so you'd go to sleep in, in, at night in the, in the, at the Darwin Center, and there'd be these giant spiders on the ceiling. And when you'd wake up in the morning, they would be gone. And so you'd be like, you know, where are they? Food was very questionable. It's like, you'd, you know, you'd go to like the little dining hall in the morning before you're diving all day and they'd give you a little piece of bread and a piece of fish. And you're like, that, that's just not going to work. Equipment, you guys know, boats, dive gear, everything was always going wrong. And then we had an unexpected problem. This was one that even in all my work, you know, work in the field, I hadn't imagined. Sea lions. The sea lions are incredibly playful in the Galapagos, the females and the pups. And in this picture, you can actually see a sea lion trying to grab a camera from Josh Feingold. <laughs> because anytime we had camera gear, or if you put survey gear down on the bottom, they would literally come and try and take it. And one time I was diving, and I was sitting on the bottom doing something, and I saw Josh in front of me and literally felt something tugging my fins. And it's one of those things where you do this, sea lion probably the best problem in the field I've ever had. So I was there in the 1980s. I went with Peter Glynn, who's a coral biologist, and he had been working for years on looking at the impact of El Nino on corals in the Galapagos, particularly the 1982-83 El Nino. And what he discovered through doing repeat surveys was that during that El Nino, something like 95% of the corals died. And that's because what happens in the Galapagos is here are the islands, and I'm going to talk about the oceanography in a minute, but what happens in the Galapagos is you have the equatorial undercurrent comes this way, and it hits the base of these volcanoes, and you get upwelling. And the western part of the Galapagos Islands is the most productive part of the islands, but during El Nino what happens is you get a pulse of warm water coming over on the surface, and it creates a cap on that upwelling, and so the upwelling shuts down, and productivity just falls flat. And one of the things that happens when that happens is the lot of the animals starve. Because in the Galapagos, it's not what you think of as a typical predator-prey system. It's a basically resource availability that controls the abundance of animals. And so here you see, so this, this is what, this is um, CWIFs, the chlorophyll data. This would be La Nino or almost a regular time in the Galapagos. And this is what, in terms of chlorophyll, what happens during a strong El Nino. And so in addition to that, the water warms and the corals there are acclimated to pretty cold water and so they also die during really strong El Ninos. One thing really amazing, this is a marine iguana and I'll tell you more about the marine iguanas, but one of the amazing things they discovered during El Ninos, you can see how skinny it is and a lot of them die, but they also discovered that they can actually shrink their bones during El Ninos to conserve energy. It's pretty unusual. So for me, as a marine scientist, one of the things I love about the Galapagos is you can go there and you can go snorkeling diving and you're snorkeling amidst tropical marine organisms. And you've got fish, sharks, sea turtles, and then a penguin swims by. <laughs> and that's just not right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna talk first about some of the geology and then I'm gonna talk about why you have such an unusual mix of animals in the Galapagos and how some of them have adapted specifically for the conditions in the islands. So geology. Really fun, I, I, I work for celebrities, so my job, I should say, is I'm the science advisor and I go down, it's horrible, two to three times a year, and I help train the naturalist, I develop the program on board, and one of the things I've done is created a geology talk for the passengers, because unfortunately, the Park Service does not do a great job in training them about geology. They do a great job on the animals, so it's been really fun to work with them on talking about the, the geology of the Galapagos and finding good stories and how to explain it to the public. Because remember, all these tourists come down, we want them to understand, we want them to understand the geology because it, A, you're going to see, they see a lot of it, but it sets the stage for why the Galapagos are where they are and why the animals are there. 
So if you look at the bathymetry, one of the things very quickly you can see is that here are the Galapagos, that as you go towards South America, it gets deeper and deeper, and there's this sort of linear ridge going this way. And if you look at the islands themselves, there's also lineations in the islands. And so this is, this is Isabella, Fernandina, Santa Cruz, San Cristobal. These are the older islands down here. This is the youngest island, so you got young to old. And as you can guess, there's a reason for that, and that's because it's a hot spot. Uh, there are hot spots all over the world. Uh, the one that almost everybody knows about, of course, is Hawaii. And in Hawaii, it's very easy to understand how it's a hot spot. So you've got a stationary plume of magma coming up from the Earth's interior. And what we'll say, I've, talked, I've spent the summer talking to a lot of volcanologists. We don't know why you have a hot spot where they are. We don't know, actually, if they may move around a little bit. Now they're thinking Hawaii and Yellowstone may have moved around in the past. So we don't know why they are where they are. When do they come and go? Do they move around a little bit? But in Hawaii, it's very easy to see what happens. As the tectonic plate moves over the hot spot, you get this very linear chain of islands. Very easy to see how that works. In the Galapagos, it's not quite that simple because there's a spreading center to the north. There's the Galapagos spreading center here. So here you're on the Nazca tectonic plate, and you're going towards South America. It's about 1,000 kilometers. Here it says miles, but it's really kilometers. You've got a plume of magma coming up. And so instead of having a linear chain, you sort of have a wedge. And we think it's because of the influence of this spreading center. But you still have that same uh, progression from old and young islands and how they change over time. So if we look at the youngest islands to the oldest, if we go again from Fernandina to, say, Española, Fernandina is one of the higher islands. Uh, it's very very new looking lava. There's hardly any vegetation. Um, it's, it's been erupting fairly frequently. Um, and then as you go to Española, and Española is probably about, we think, maybe 4 million years old. So you're talking about a span of maybe 300,000 years old or to 1 million to about 4 million. And that deep ridge is like 12 million. But you can see, one of the things I love to show passengers is I make them think about and it's so visible where you see a new island where you're seeing the, the lava like this. And then as you go into the no, older islands, they're eroded, they're heavily eroded, they're vegetated, and they're also lower because as the volcanoes get older, they're cooling and they're getting heavier and they're sinking into the mantle. So they're also lower because of that. But you can visually see this within the span of, you know, two-day trip. You can see the hot spot and how these islands have changed over time. So, some of the eruptions. This is Fernandina. This is the youngest island, the most frequently erupting. Um, there's no regularity on the eruptions. And in fact, we all expected that Fernandina in 2015, we're all expecting this to be the next volcano that erupted. But it was not. It was Wolf Volcano on Isabella. And in fact, the ship that I work on, Celebrity Expedition, of course, every time I go, I'm always like, I just want to see a small eruption. Just, Never happens. But of course, when they see this one, I get you know, the videos, the photographs, the naturalists are like, Ellen, you know, look what happened. And they were saying it was really funny because they were, it was on a Sunday, and they had just picked up their passengers. And I guess it, at about 10 o'clock at night, they saw just this red glare in the horizon. And the, some of the officers, they actually they thought it was somebody who was shooting off a flare. And the naturalist got up and said, that's no flare. And so they actually got the captain to divert the cruise track to go over to see the volcanic eruption. But again, nobody expected it to be at Wolf Volcano. So it was a surprise, which is always sort of fun. Now, Sierra Negra is one of the volcanoes on Isabella. And it's erupted over, a couple times over, over, over time, pretty recently. But I've gotten data from the um, geophysical survey folks in Ecuador, as well as um, from scientists in Miami who are using INSTAR to look at ground deformation over the volcano, so using satellite imagery. And Sierra Negro is overdue for an eruption. This is 2018, these are earthquakes right over the volcano, and this is deformation. So the INSTAR data is here, um, and volcanic tremor is in the, over time, is in the orange, and you can see it's, it's precipitously escalating. And so they think it's overdue. And so you know, every time now we've gone down, I've been sending the data down saying, you guys, keep an eye out. We're waiting for Sierra Negra to, to erupt. What happens when these eruptions happen, um, 
the park, one of the things, the park sends out rangers. When Wolf Volcano erupted, they sent out rangers because a couple years ago they discovered a unique pink iguana, only one in the world, found on, and it's only found on Wolf Volcano. And so they sent out a team of rangers to make sure the tortoises were okay and the, the pink iguanas were okay. And luckily the lava flow went the other way, so they were safe. But we're really, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to go down again uh, maybe in June, and so I'm kind of hoping it will wait. Just wait till June. When you get down there, the volcanic features that you can see and hike around are amazing. And so this is a view from a, an island called Bartolome looking across to Santiago. And one of the, my favorite hikes is in, the, um, is in the early morning. You don't believe me. You do not want to be on those lava fields during midday. But early morning, you can hike out to these scoria cones. You can land over here and hike out. And it's really amazing features. So here's a Pahoyhoy lava flow that you can, and you can see they also have uplifts and these cracks are not only from uplifts, but also cooling. When the lava's cooling, you get a lot of cracking. So Pahoyhoy flows and you, these, you get these amazing features with different lava flows. Um, and here you can see these are scoria cones. And this was a Pahoyhoy flow that was obviously after this earlier scoria cones. And these are pyroclasts that have just been thrown up around a vent and you get these cones. And I always like, I tell the naturalists, you know, geologists is all about playing detective. You've got to look for the contacts between the rocks so to tell which happened first. So I always say, look at the, you know, the lava flow versus the scoria cones. This lava flow is about 100 years old. So it's pretty recent. And miles and miles expanded Santiago Island. So a really amazing place to hike. And this is one of my feature, favorite features on that hike. It's something called the Hornito. Has anybody here ever heard of a Hornito? Oh, yes, we've got somebody in the back. Oh, yeah, see, I had, never, I had never heard of one of these things. They also call them lava ovens. So this was just on my last trip there. One of the, one of the, the kids on the uh, cruise, he loved this. So we hiked up. This is the Hornito right there. And the way it works is you have a lava tunnel, and you get a crack in the roof of the lava tunnel. And every time the lava pulses by, you get it shooting up and coming and, and falling back down and cooling very quickly because it's still fairly liquid so it spreads out so the surface area is exposed to the air and it cools very fast so you see how shiny it is and you can't see it here but this in the sun would be very shiny as well so there's a lava tunnel here and the lava is coming through and it's periodically shooting up and you get this sort of it's like a lava drip castle so yeah, they're really cool um, you also have something similar, but they're, they're bigger in scale, and, and the, the lava is, tends to be a little bit cooled a little bit more, so it's sort of, we always say it splooges. It's not, it's not as runny as in the, the Hernitos, but these are spatter cones. And this is Bartolome, one of the islands where we go hiking, and you can see just there's so many spatter cones around this island that we don't, nobody knows where the main vent is because there's so many spatter cones covering it. And I actually talked to, there's a guy, Dennis Geis, who's been working on the geology in the Galapagos for a long time. And I asked him about this. I said, where, where's the main vent in Bartolome? He's like, nobody knows, because it's been covered over so many times. So one of the things I brought, I, I even brought props. <laughs> so um, this summer, I was in Hawaii doing research for a new book I'm working on. And this, see these fountains? Right, the fountain like here on Sierra Negro, this was from Galapagos. Fountain like this, if it's a really fast, high fountain, I had never seen this before, will create a little rock called reticulite. And I'm going to pass this around. It's like a little glass sponge. And what happens is when the fountain comes up, there's not enough time when it cools, so you don't even get air bubbles encapsulated. So it's an open framework. And one of the weirdest things is it sinks in water. And when you when I pull it out, you can actually squeeze the water out. It's the weirdest thing, so I'll pass that around. So I, I, of course, it just fell in my hands from the National Park in Hawaii. <laughs> but it was just, I've never, I'd never even heard of reticulite, so I, I, it was really interesting. One of the things you get to see very clearly in the Galapagos is succession of, of vegetation. So you get to see pioneer plants, and then how they break down the land, and you get to see the succession of other plants coming in. And one of the first plants you see on the lava flows are our lava cactus. We always joke with the, the guests when they're trying to tell us what the name of things are. We say, if you just front it by lava, 
Galapagos or Darwin, you're pretty good. So it's either lava cactus, Darwin cactus, or Galapagos, because you have so many endemic species. So this is a lava cactus, and it's one of the first things that comes in, starts to break down the, the rock and create soil so that other vegetation can come in and take over on the islands. Really, really, one of my favorite hikes is a place called, or it's either Urbina Bay, or sometimes people call it Urbina Bay. Um, it's on Isabella Island, and in 1954, prior to a volcanic eruption, there was an, an uplift, 15 feet uplift. And it happened all at once. So this wasn't a gradual uplift. It happened all at once, and all along the coastal zone of, of Urbina Bay, it was uplifted 15 feet, including a coral reef. And so now you can go hiking around the uplifted coral reef, and you can actually see the zonation from branching to head corals in the, in the coral skeletons that are left behind. It's really interesting. And well, the story goes that when this uplift happened, no, you know, there was nobody living out there, and there weren't a lot of cruise ships, but some fishermen smelled this horrible smell. <laughs> because imagine all the fish that were in that coral reef were now on land decomposing. And so the fishermen discovered this because they were like, oh my god, what's that smell? And they went over to discover it. This is also a place where um, great work on El Nino has been done. One of the coral heads, which is 1,400 years old, they, Dunbar and El, uh, Phil Dunbar took a, a core from that coral head, 400 years old, and looked, did oxygen isotopes to look at temperature and got one of the longest records of El Nino from the Galapagos. And that was a classic paper showing that El Ninos have happened um, over time, naturally, was from this uplifted reef in the Galapagos. This is sort of an interesting place. So this is one of the, the islands called South Plaza. Now, if you ask me how many islands there are in the Galapagos, some people will say 15, 14. It depends what your definition of an island is. South Plaza was one of my favorites. It's a very small island. It's an uplifted island, so it's not, it, you, it hasn't seen a volcanic eruption, but it's uplifted. And so what you have are you have a lot of basalt rocks that have been come up from underground, they've been exposed, they weren't erupted, um, they were extruded, and you see, you can sort of see the blocks. These are basalt, but this, this place looks really weird. And they call this Galapagos marble. And I'm like, what? So of course, I had to take a little sample to see what it was. So if you look at the rock, it's really shiny, and some of it's very pink, and it's really hard. And so everybody thought it was just, it's a place where the sea lions like to rest, and they thought that it was just the sea lions had smoothed the rocks down, and I was like, no, there's a crust on that, those rocks. So I had to take a little sample, you know, kind of smuggled it out of the Galapagos, and uh, gave it to a chemist to look at, and it turns out it was calcium phosphate. So what do you guys think that crust was made out of? It was calcium phosphate. Anybody get any guesses? Yeah, it's sea lion poop. It's sea lion poop rocks. Maybe the only, I was thinking on my way here, I was thinking, that would make a great like master's project to do the chemistry, how does it work? Yeah, so the crust, these rocks have a crust of calcium phosphate on it, and so what, you know, they get rubbed down, you get some rain, and then it recrystallizes when it dries, and it's really interesting. Poop rocks. The sand in the Galapagos is also really interesting. All the islands have different sands. Some islands have volcanic fragments. Some have um, biologically produced sands, mostly coral and coral and algae. And some, this, this is a really unusual sand. There are a couple islands where you have sand that is made of sea urchin spines mainly. So that, these are pencil urchin spines. And this is another sand that has olivine crystals. And they don't know exactly where it's coming from, but the olivine is preferentially eroding outside of, out of the volcanic rocks and creating this really gorgeous green sand. And so all around the islands, I love going to the different islands and it's a, it's to look at the different sands. There's one island called Rabida. The rocks and the sand are bright red. Clearly has a higher iron concentration than all the other islands, but it's not clear exactly why that is. So, Animals and oceanography. So there's a, a confluence of currents in the, in the Galapagos that creates this unusual mix of animals and also drives the productivity. So here's the Galapagos, South America. So you've got the Humboldt Current, Humboldt Current coming up from Antarctica here. Panama flow, they call it, coming down from, up from California, coming down this way. 
You've got south equatorial current going this way, but then as I mentioned earlier, you have the Cromwell current or the south equatorial undercurrent or the equatorial undercurrent coming here, hitting the Galapagos and upwelling. And it's that undercurrent that is really the most important for the productivity. And again, another picture of this, this idea with the upwelling. So here's chlorophyll, here's sea surface temperature. And I know John and you guys are going there. This is what I was saying, temperature, even temperature changes not only throughout the year, but when you're in the western islands versus the southeast islands. Like you'll go here to go snorkeling, it's pretty warm, pretty, it's not so bad. And you go over here where the upwelling is very strong and it's freezing, like 50s or 60s. So up when the upwelling is really strong, there's a huge difference. And again, here's where you see the highest productivity is in the western islands. So some of the animals. The Galapagos penguins, these are some of my favorite. They are the second smallest penguins in the world. They are the furthest north penguins. They're, they're only about that big. Um, there's about, there's a couple hundred pairs in the Galapagos. It's not a huge population. In fact, right now the, the Park Service is trying to help them breed and is building our little penguin habitats for them to breed in. One of the wonderful things in the Galapagos, if you're really lucky, is you get to snorkel with them and you get to see them feeding. And here's a penguin that's just caught a fish. And so one of the interesting things I've seen with the penguins is you'll be snorkeling and there'll be um, some macroalgae on the bottom and I've actually seen penguins herding fish schools into the macroalgae and then diving into the macroalgae to catch the fish. So you get to see all sorts of behaviors. What's one of the most wonderful things about the Galapagos is that the animals are so well protected that they will do all of their behaviors right in front of you. Uh, it, it, to me, it's one of the most special things about it. It's not just the animals themselves. And again, you can see how some of the distributions and sizes of animals relate to the productivity. This is just a, a map of penguin distribution. You only find them, again, here where it's the most productive, and they find a few individuals in these other areas, but not many. Sea lions are, of course, one of, you know, one of the most prevalent uh, animals. You know, it's one of those things where you say, I can guarantee you will see a sea lion. And they are really wonderful, and I got this little video to show you. You never know what they're going to do. And while this is getting to the fun part, this is in a place actually called Elizabeth Bay, where the Park Service tells you what you can do in the Galapagos, whether you can snorkel, hike, or just do a zodiac ride. In Elizabeth Bay, it's a, a beautiful mangrove ecosystem, and you're just allowed to do zodiac rides. So those are the guests in the zodiac. And we're sitting there, and a sea lion comes around. You know, they're very playful. None of us had ever seen any of them do this before. That's the cooling water coming out of the engine. The engine stopped. And what you'll see is they love the feel. They're not going to drink it, but he loves the feel of that water on his whiskers. <laughs> so, yeah, so he, this is really funny. <laughs> it's great. One of, one of the best things I've ever seen in the Galapagos is we had a gentleman come who must have been in his 70s a very formal man, and I told, we were out snorkeling, and I said to him, look, if a pup or a young juvenile comes out with us and looks playful, seems playful, here's the trick. Dive down and sort of twirl around in somersault, and if they want to play, they'll come do it with you. And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm like, no, really. So we were out snorkeling, and a sea lion came out, and I said, watch, and I did it. The sea lion came play with me, so he dove down, just sort of twisted around, the sea lions started playing with him, circling him. He popped up and giggled like a little girl. <laughs> it was, I, I will never forget just the look on his face. And then, of course, he went down and did it again. It was pure joy to have a wild animal come over and play with you. You know, we didn't have to chase them or anything. It was a really, for me, it was a special moment to see that. One of the other endemic species in the Galapagos are the flightless cormorants. So here, obviously, in Florida, all the cormorants fly. But when cormorants arrived in the Galapagos, there was no competition. There was tons of food. And so over time, they didn't need, even need to go from island to island, and they lost the ability to fly. And so you can see that the wings are sort of mutated vestiges of what the wings on the cormorants here are. And their legs are much more muscular, and their, feet are, their web feet are a little bit bigger for diving and swimming. So the flightless cormorants here, the cormorants, they also nest in the trees. In the Galapagos, the cormorants um, nest right on the rocks, right next to the shore. 
and the juveniles are extremely curious. So you'll be out snorkeling, and this happened to me. All of a sudden, you feel something like pecking your leg, and you're, you know, again, it's a cormorant. They're, they're very curious with snorkelers in the water. Let's see. Oh, the marine iguanas. So again, another endemic species in the Galapagos are the marine iguanas, true marine iguanas. Here in Florida, you'll see marine iguanas swim. But these marine iguanas feed underwater. They can actually stay underwater for about 45 minutes. They can dive down to something like 50 feet. It's sort of debatable. The story goes that when Darwin was in the Galapagos, supposedly they tied a marine iguana to like a rock to see how long it could stay underwater. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> that wouldn't be so good. But it's really interesting. What they do is the way they swim, and you can see it up here, is they take their appendages and they basically plaster them to their body and they just use their tails to swim. And I'll show you the land iguana versus the marine iguana. One of the differences is that the tails on the marine iguanas are flat, paddle-like, versus the land iguanas, which are rounder. They are um, endothermic, so they don't control their body heat. So what happens is they'll go in the mornings, they'll go out and they'll dive, uh, start feeding on the algae, then they'll come back and they'll sit in huge groups. Um, and just sit in this, you know, sort of sun tanning in the, in, the, in the sun here, warming up on the black rocks. But because they're eating algae, they have a, their diet is too much salt in it. So they will sit up there and they will sneeze salt out their nose. And one of the funny things is if you get closer to them, they don't really stress or run away, but they'll start sneezing the salt and you're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> one day we went to a hike where the landing was literally a carpet of marine iguanas. And this woman was, you know, we were like, okay, they you know, won't hurt you, but just kind of walk around. And she had a walking stick, and she was walking through them. Her walking stick broke. She literally did a nosedive into the iguanas. And I, we were like, oh, no, we're going to have to call out the medics. And she just calmly stood up and she said, well, they're rather soft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really funny. Different, on different islands, there are subspecies. There's one island on Espanola where during breeding season, they become very colorful. And the different islands, you can see that. And you can really see the differences in the size between the western islands and some of the eastern islands. And um, one of the strangest things ever is if you're snorkeling or diving and you are very lucky and you get to see one underwater feeding. Because it just doesn't look right. They look like miniature di you know, dinosaurs underwater. But again, it's just such a weird thing to see them. Um, land iguanas, as I said, so they have the marine iguanas and there's land iguanas and they obviously look distinctly different. The shape of the tail is different. Their bodies are different. Uh, these burrow in the sand. Um, there's one island, that little island, South Plaza, where they, there have been hybrids found and they call them weirdos. They're, they are not, they're sterile, we think they're sterile, but the m male marine iguanas appear to be able to mate with the female land iguanas. Uh, but there's only a couple seen, but one of the things that they're able to do, the marine iguanas actually um, have very long claws and they're excellent climbers, and the hybrids, can, we've seen them climbing up trees because they're kind of a cross between the two. These feed on uh, cactus. They're kind of omnivores. They feed mostly on cactus, but if there's uh, insects or even like a sea, a sea lion placenta, they'll feed on that. Um, they're, these are, they're kind of skittish, but they get to be a couple feet. The biggest ones are a couple feet along. And one of the interesting things they do is they set up territories around cactus. And what they do is they wait for the pads to fall off the cactus trees. And so they'll set up a territory because that's their favorite food. And you know, like, don't come near my tree. And so we, we sort of know individuals that are going to be at different tree cactus trees. One of my favorite islands is Española. Española, what's one of the interesting things is so in the western islands where those new islands are, you have some of the bigger animals. But Española is one of the older islands and has one of the most uh, abundant wildlife, not diversity-wise necessarily, but there's a lot of wildlife in a small area. It's the only island in the Galapagos where you find the waved albatross. And they come in, they fly in around May. Uh, they spend a couple years out at sea. They fly in around May. They mate and have the chicks. The chicks grow up and they're ready to fly around December and then they take off. A uh, couple of interesting things. Uh, here's, I love, this is one of my favorite shots. This is a chick and a, an adult. For many years, and you'd always hear, oh, they're monogamous, they mate for life. 
Well, once they start doing the genetics on the eggs, it's not necessarily true. Basically what happens is when they land, you get a little sneaker males come in and hook up with the, with the females, and so the chicks aren't necessarily the, the offspring of the mate for life. Um, but they didn't know that until they started doing the genetics. The other weird thing about the, the albatross, for some reason in the Galapagos, they roll their eggs. The only place they do it, and nobody's quite sure why they do it, because it, it, it probably, you, you also see a lot of them that become not viable, and it must have something to do with them rolling it, but for some reason they do it. They do, however, these, these birds are, they can be like three feet tall, they're huge. And one of my very favorite things, if you get there around May, is you might be lucky enough to see their courtship dance. And again, they will do this right next to the trail. <laughs> And, and of course, the naturalists are always like, we need to move on. I'm like, no, I need to stay and watch it. So and sometimes you'll, th you'll see, look how many pairs there are. There's some pair over here. And sometimes you'll see three of them doing it. And you know, whoever does the best dance. And they're, they actually make a, a really funny sound, too. So that's, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Of course, one of everybody's favorite is the blue-footed booby. And they will, again, they'll have their chicks and they'll do their blue-footed booby dance right on the trail. Here's, a, here's one with a very young chick that's probably a couple days old. Um, that's a chick. So the chicks sometimes look older than the, the, the adults and they're bigger. Um, and one of the interesting things about it, you know, everybody's asked about the blue feet. It's not like a flamingo. It's not necessarily what they're eating. You know, flamingos, it's the crustaceans that they're eating. But in the blue-footed boobies, they've done, scientists did some experiments where they withheld food. And when they withheld food, the blue started to fade on their feet. So we know that the strength of that blue color has to do with how healthy they are and what they're eating. But the color itself, they think it comes from the structure of the feet and it scatters light. So they think it's the structure of the feet, not actually pigment that they're eating, but it's the, the hue or the strength of the blue has to do with how healthy they are. And obviously that's so that the males can attract the best females with the best blue feet. <laughs> And here's one of their uh, really interesting behaviors. This is a male here, and I know it's a male because he's doing something called sky pointing. So when the females are flying around overhead, they will do that behavior where they'll, they'll look up like that, put their wings back, and they actually will whistle. Like, I mean, like somebody, it sounds just like somebody whistling, and the females honk. So the male and female have different sounds, so he's trying to attract the females flying overhead. There are also red-footed boobies in the Galapagos, only on a few islands. Now, they're not as prevalent as the blue-footed, and there are two morphotypes of the red-footed. There's a brown morphotype and a white morphotype. Um, and they have kind of an interesting-looking blue bill. Um, and then there's also a Nazca booby, and they're really beautiful birds. The, and what's interesting is they sort of fish in different regions. The blue-footed boobies fish right along the shore, and the Nazca boobies fish a little bit farther offshore so that there's not a lot of competition between the different types of boobies. Another interesting thing with the Nazca boobies is sometimes they will have two chicks, and they have something called sibling side. Because the parents can really only sustain one chick, sometimes one of the chicks will kill the other or push it out of the nest, and then it gets killed, And so because it can only really survive one chick. One of the other things that happens in the Galapagos when things die or, you know, you'll have something like a frigate might have a, like a bad landing and be hanging in the tree, you don't remove them. You know, it's not like there's roadkill. You don't remove them. So every time you're out hiking, there's like, you know, a dead bird hanging. And it's perfectly natural, but we're not used to that. And, you know, it's funny because kids are always like, oh, no, no. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. And there aren't a lot of scavengers. And so one of the things that happens with the marine iguanas during El Nino, when those die, there's nothing that scavenges them, and it, at times it can be pretty dry there, and they actually mummify, mummify up on the lava. So you'll, you'll be walking around and you'll find mummified um, marine iguanas. This is a red-billed tropic bird. The, the naturalist in the Galapagos, I think this is their favorite photo to compete against because they're very fast flyers and very hard to get a good photograph of. And so that's a beautiful red-billed tropic bird. They nest in the cliffs, and so you don't really get to see them in nests too much. And there are the top, one of the top predators are the Galapagos hawks. And again, you can see they don't really care that you're right there. That's, you know, talk about, you know, perfect for your photograph. They will eat um, insects, the iguanas. They eat, there are Galapagos snakes that they feed on. Uh, so really beautiful birds. A few more birds. There's a endemic uh, 
swallowtail gull up here, and they are the world's only nocturnal gulls. They feed at night, and there's a chick. Again, one of the great things about the Galapagos is you get to see these chicks. That's a male frigate bird trying to attract the females, blowing up its, its neck pouch. Um, herons, and yes, there are flamingos in the Galapagos. Not a lot. It's not a huge population of flamingos, but there is a population of flamingos. And of course, the famous Darwin finches. And in different islands, you can see the different shapes of the beaks. The, uh, the birds have adapted to different feeding strategies. Some feed on seeds, um, some feeds on insects, and you can see that in their different beaks. One of the really interesting finches, um, we call it the vampire finch, it started, it was in a very dry island, and it started feeding on parasites and uh, insects on birds. And what would happen is when it would feed on those birds, on the insects, it would cause a little cut on the bird, and it would start drinking the blood, and then it became adapted to drinking the blood. And so now they actually go after the birds because it's such a dry island, and they feed on the blood. It's kind of weird. One of the other things that's been really interesting recently in the Galapagos is um, there's been work that's shown they're already starting to see some changes in the birds' beaks, and they're thinking that now evolution and adaptation happens a lot faster than they, early, they really thought. Over a couple of years, they're starting to see changes. Everybody loves the giant tortoises. Um, there's only a couple islands where you can see them in the wild unless you go up for a long hike, but it depends on where the park lets you go. But at the Darwin Center and the Park Service, they are breeding the islands, the tortoises, to, to repopulate the, the ones that were taken by whalers and pirates for food. A lot of them were decimated because of that. And so now they're doing a really good job repopulating them. And there's a couple places on Santa Cruz where they have preserves where it's really nice. You can just go walk out in the wild sort of preserve and really get a good view of the tortoises. OK, so when I was there doing research in the 80s, I was out running. I heard this god-awful screaming. And I thought, oh my god, oh, you know, somebody's being murdered. What? And so I was like, I, I better go check out and see what this is. It was a pen at the breeding center. And when, it was when the male giant tortoise climbs up on the females. She literally lets out these unbelievably loud sounds. And you could see why. They're huge. <laughs> Um, there's also tons of sea turtles in the Galapagos, Pacific green sea turtles. We were there. There's a place called Vincente Roca one time where it's a, it's a, a small cove. And you, typically when you go there, you see the sea turtles sleeping. Green sea turtles can stay on the bottom for up to five hours. Turns out, uh, you know, one of those little trivia facts, they can actually um, get oxygen through osmosis through their cloaca. In other words, they can breathe through their butt. But this place at Vincente Roca, you'll, we could go out there and we'd see them sleeping on the bottom all the time. We were out there maybe two years ago, and even the naturalists who go there every week had never seen that there must have been one to 200 sea turtles just floating around on the surface. And so we got everybody all guessed in you know, with, uh, with snorkel gear. And we said, no kicking, just go in there and float with them. And they don't care that you're there. It was an amazing experience. Uh, underwater diving that's really spectacular. The they're very famous for hammerheads. I've had a big school of hammerheads circling around me diving. A lot of tropical fish. King, this is one of the most common, King Angel. I love this uh, sea star. This is called the chocolate chip sea star. The corals, there's pavona, there's poslapora branching corals, and then there's a lot of this orange cup coral. So again, it's, it's kind of an unusual mix of cold and, and warm water creatures. And here are two of my favorite pictures ever. We thought this one on the left was faked. This is a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. <laughs> and when the naturalist brought this to myself and the cruise director, we were like, come on, that can't be real. But yep, blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And these are some clouds. This is a place called Kicker Rock in San Cristobal Island. And to show this to some meteorologists, and what they said is, you know, you've got convection cells, you've got air rising up over the island. And you have some shear wind blowing this way, shearing, and so you get the tops blown that way. That was a beautiful picture, right at sunset. So environmentally, the park is extremely strict. And there are, there are literally no docks for big ships. And you typically have to go everywhere in zodiacs or small boats. And so for instance, this is where most of the passengers, they'll, you, this is an airport. The airport's right here. You fly in. You take a little bus around this island. 
you come out and you get on these Zodiacs to go out to all of the cruise ships, whatever it is. Um, and then at the landing sites, again, there's really, there are no docks on these landing sites. It's all, you go by Zodiac and then you have sometimes, and let me tell you, sometimes these are pretty hairy landings. And I, you know, I, I'm part of the things that I help celebrity with is safety and it's not half the time I'm out there, like, no. But it's really to preserve the integrity of the islands that they do this. They're really trying to um, limit how much construction they do on the islands. But I will tell you, there is no OSHA in Ecuador. <laughs> and so a lot of the places we go hiking and we go and do things you would never be allowed to do in the US. Um, and again, one of the best things is that the animals will interact with you. I mean, this, at this trip, we think that these are little sea lion pups and the kids that were snorkeling, we think because they had wetsuits on, they thought they were other sea lion pups. And so they would not leave this little kid alone. And it was just the most wonderful thing. He was so excited. It was really fun to watch. But again, that's one of the special things about the Galapagos is that you can get so close to the animals. So environmental issues. One of the biggest ones is invasive species. You can imagine with all the ships that have gone there in the past, the, the whalers, the pirates, you got rats, goats, dogs, feral cats. There's even donkeys on the islands. We now have a paper wasp that, it, you know, one of the really interesting things, we had wasps on the islands, and I came back years ago from hiking, and I said to the doctor on our ship, he said, um, do you have an EpiPen? There are a lot of wasps. And she said, what? we have Benadryl. I'm like, no, that's not the same thing. They didn't even know what EpiPens are, and they don't have EpiPens in Ecuador. We smuggle them in for our ships because they never had wasps that sting, but these are invasive. And so they have wasps. The goats are a huge problem, and they're outcompeting some of the tortoises. And so one of the islands, one of the really interesting things is the mix of climate change and invasive species. So the goats have eaten a lot of the vegetation down, but then they got rid of the goats, but then the vegetation wasn't coming back because of climate change. And so there's this interaction going on that they're really trying to understand, but the big thing is to try and eradicate a lot of these invasive species. And you can imagine, it's really hard. South Plaza, that one island, they had rats, and the only way they could eradicate them is they had to collect, they had to capture all the land iguanas, and then they put out poison pellets, but they couldn't do it with all the land So they, I mean, they ca had to capture thousand, you know, 2,000 land iguanas before they could get rid of the rats. The donkeys are a problem because they actually eat the bark of the Puntia cactus, and when you eat the bark, it kills the tree, and so they're trying to get rid of the donkeys. Huge problem in the Galapagos. They're very strict about now, you know, obviously you can imagine people coming in, what you bring with you. You can't bring any fruit with you with seeds. Um, they check all the luggage going in and out. They're trying to be a lot stricter on all of that. Illegal fishing. So all around the Galapagos is a marine reserve. But what happens is two things happen. One time, sometimes you get illegal ships coming in. They, I think last year they caught a ship with 350 sharks on it, shark finning and they confiscated the boat, which was great. But you also have what happens is sometimes you have industrial ships sit on the edge of the reserve in the Galapagos, and they work with some of the local people, and they go out and they bring them fish. Um, so it's a huge problem. They had a problem with sea cucumber overfishing for a while. So you know they're trying to manage it, but you're in a really remote area. Enforcement is incredibly difficult. Um, they don't have a lot of money in the Galapagos, so it's not like they have a fleet of patrol vessels. They, you know, they have a couple that they send out, so enforcing that marine reserve is really difficult. The good thing is, and this is true in conservation as well, is the park system. The way it works is everybody who goes in there, if you go on anywhere in the park or if you're on a boat, you have to have a licensed naturalist with you. Part of that licensed naturalist's job is if they see anybody doing anything wrong, they have to report it. You know, obviously in the group, they have to maintain, manage their group, but if they see an illegal fisherman, or if they see somebody on an island without a, a, a naturalist, or if they see somebody polluting, or we sometimes we have find in, entangled uh, animals and we will either try and untangle them or we'll report it, it's actually really efficient that way. Because if they don't do it, it's their job. So that helps a lot, but it's, it's clearly not perfect. There are actually something like 30,000 people that live in the Galapagos. There are two main towns on San Cristobal and Santa Cruz. And it, this was becoming a huge problem for the Galapagos because once you have more people moving there to sort of work in the, cruise, in, in the tourist industry, then you have more waste. They need more resources. They need more homes. So 
immigration was becoming a real problem and I think maybe two years ago they came up with new laws where the only way you can immigrate is if you're married or um, I think I think it's if you're married or your son or daughter or something lives there. It has to be family related. You can't just go anymore to the Galapagos to get a job. So they're being a lot more strict. And that's, I will tell you, you know, you hear sometimes people say, oh, the Galapagos are changing. They're changing because of invasive species, but the islands themselves outside the towns are not because they're really well controlled. The towns have expanded and the towns themselves are changing, but the overall islands are not. Um, climate change. There was just a paper came out yesterday that showed somebody did took coral cores in the northern islands, Darwin and Wolf, and they, they think since the 1700s there's been slight warming in the Galapagos. But it's not, it's not clear how much. I've also seen papers that suggest that the upwelling will strengthen in the Galapagos with climate change. So I think that's an unknown. We're not sure yet, but they're starting to look at it. The bigger thing is El Nino and climate change. If El Ninos get stronger in climate change, it's going to have a huge impact in the Galapagos because when you get a strong El Nino, it's so devastating. I, like, I always show this picture. So I compare the ship that I work on, the expedition with the Beagle. <laughs> and so you look, you know, they're actually, you know, they're a little bit different in size. Uh, beam a little different, but you know, speed, variable, you know, we have to do about 16 knots. Draft is about the same. And then Crew, about the same on the two ships. Of course, guests, not many. Darwin was a guest, essentially. Hardtack and cockroaches, I think we do much better. <laughs> so it's sort of fun. Um, and right now, Celebrity, I'm happy to say, is building a brand new ship, the MV Flora, that will start sailing May of 2019. It will be the most innovative ship in the Galapagos environmentally. And, uh, I'm working with them a little bit on, we're actually going to put a small lab on it, it's sort of a skeletal lab, so if we have people want to come down and do work, whether it's education or research, you know, we'll have a place for them. And I'm really, it's one of the reasons I work with Celebrity, because they have the best environmental record in the Galapagos. They've won a lot of awards for their ships. And again, this one is being built specifically in Finland just for the Galapagos. So with that, I'll open it up for questions.